dialogue and debate. And these divided times, it's more important than ever that we have spaces where these complex and competing ideas can be discussed in the context of civility and respect. In brief, our goal is to, to provide that space where we can have these difficult conversations without feeling uh, or being difficult to one another, uh, where we can engage in new perspectives and take on challenging issues, especially ones that generate passion and opinion and disagreement. So today's program, Remove, Rename, or Replace, Monuments to Past Heroes in a Changing Society, challenges us on how we view our history and our present. Whether it's Confederate statues, Yaki Way, Faneuil Hall, all local examples of this conversation, each of these memorials are to heroes from a time when many in society were not allowed a voice. These monuments matter to us because what we see displayed in society in public spaces matters. As we struggle with our shared history, societal divisions have led to an exploration of the monument builders, their intent, and importantly, what these monuments mean to us today. To guide us in this conversation, um, I, we have a wonderful panel. First, uh, Raul Fernandez, um, Adrian Walker, and Candace Belanoff. Professor Raul Fernandez is the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development, and is a lecturer in the Wheelock's, Hi Wheelock's Higher Education Administration Program. He's an accomplished educator, um, and with many people having attended his workshops on campuses, conferences, and at organizations around the country and internationally. Adrian Walker is a columnist for the Boston Globe's Metro section, he provides commentary and opinion on local and regional news, as well as society and culture. Mr. Walker started as a Metro columnist in 1998, and his column appears on Mondays and Fridays. Today's session will be moderated by Professor Candace Balanoff, who is a maternal and child health epidemiologist in the Department of Community Health Sciences at Boston University School of Public Health. She's an accomplished scholar and popular teacher and is well known for her social justice advocacy efforts both within Boston University and in the community. Thank you and uh, please welcome our panel. Thank you, Yvette. Um, so welcome everybody. This is really terrific to have you all here. I hope everybody has availed themselves of snacks and the beverages that have fruit and I got a really long piece of basil in mine, so I had to work on that for a while. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here uh, with these esteemed guests in our midst, and I'd love to jump right in um, and have each of our guests say a few words about um, the issue of monuments, the issue of whether or not and when and how these should come down. Um, and I'd like to have us talk at some, uh, you know, at some length about the implications for public health um, and why we should be having this conversation in this space. So we didn't flip a coin at the beginning, so I don't, um, I guess we could go alphabetically and have uh, Professor Fernandez start. Sure. Uh, hey everybody, thanks first of all for, for having me here. Greetings from, uh, from the, the education folks on, on the other campus. Uh, I'm always excited to come to the School of Public Health. There's a ton of just really great work going on. Uh, I am now, uh, on the other side of the live stream, because I've I've been I've been where you all are. I see you over there, uh, live streaming, watching some of the really great events that happen here. So I'm excited to be on this side of it now. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to engage in a conversation with you all, and then also with you all about this because I think uh, first and foremost, I think it matters. I think that the the built environment matters to us uh, when we walk into um, to spaces and in public places. Uh, and, and whether or not we see ourselves reflected, I think matters, but then also what we as a society put out there uh, to say that we've, we've, we've put this name here or we've built this, this statue here because we think that this person matters in a real meaningful way. And make no mistake, this is, this is an, an honor to have your name enshrined in a building or to have your image on a statue uh, in, in a public or even private space. And, and so I think that, uh, that we should, we should have conversations about what that means. We should have conversations about whether or not um, what's been enshrined before should continue to be enshrined today. And I look forward to having that conversation with you all. Well, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, 
I'm the person here who knows nothing about public health. I'll let you know that right <laughs> up front. Um, thinking about uh, this, this discussion a little while ago, I was thinking that I actually attended school at a monument. I went to Robert E. Lee Jr. High <laughs> in Miami, which was a deeply disconcerting experience. Um, and I've also been involved in monuments here. I led a successful crusade to rename Yawkey Way, which we could talk about later. Mm -hmm. I felt that Tom Yawkey's name should not be right. on a public street in Boston for reasons I'll be happy to explain later if you want. Absolutely. But I also think the monuments have power and have meaning and that we shouldn't necessarily just accept what we've been handed as monuments and as history. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if you don't mind expanding on your crusade to um, rename Yawkey Way, can you say a little more about why that particular monument, if you will, was so important to you um, and what bringing it down um, or changing it uh, meant and what the implications were for you? Sure. I'll start at the beginning. Tom Yawkey was the longtime owner of the Boston Red Sox. He bought the Sox in the early 30s and his family, he died in 1977. His family owned the Red Sox until the early 90s. Uh, almost immediately after he died in 1977, Jersey Street, the street Fenway Park is on, was renamed Yawkey Way. Now, Tom Yawkey is a really problematic historical figure. I mean, the Red Sox, as many of us know, were the last team to integrate by far, by tw you know, 12 years after Jackie Robinson started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Sox got their first black player. So he was sort of an avowed I, some people dispute this. I don't think it's really disputable. He was an avowed bigot, and I just didn't feel that his name belonged on a public street, and especially that's, you know, a public street that is so much a part of the image of the city. So I started writing about this. I'm going to get the date wrong, but like 2016 or something like that, 2015. And I wrote columns about this off and on, you know, not like one after the other, but I wrote four or five over the course of about two and a half years. Eventually, the Red Sox got involved and also said they wanted the street renamed. And that was sort of the tipping point. Uh, the other, the, uh, there were two other businesses on the street. They got on board. And finally, it was changed from Yawkey Way back to the original Jersey Street last mm -hmm. year. So Excellent. that was sort of the campaign. Excellent. And what was the, um, what was the main source of pushback that you, I'm sure you got a lot of very public and vocal pushback about that rename. What, oh, yeah. who, who were you hearing from and what was their argument for keeping it as is? There was a ton of pushback from the Yaki Foundation, um, right. which did not want the, the name of its namesake besmirched. They said, they argued falsely that Yaki's name, which is on things all over the city, including a Boys and Girls Club in Roxbury, a building at Mass General, there are a bunch of Yaki's. Mm -hmm. A building a at Boston University Yaki too. Stuff, right, yeah. there's a Yaki building at BU. So they said, oh, God, his name will have to come down from everything. And, you know. and so you know, there were several public hearings involved in the process of renaming it. And they would come to all, with their lobbyists mm -hmm. to all the hearings and say this was a terrible thing. Terrific. And do you want to comment on the Yaki issue? Or um, I've heard yeah. you speak before about the importance of bringing down certain monuments. And you've, uh, if you don't mind sharing with the audience who haven't heard you speak about it, sure. um, there's a very um, interesting case in Boston of uh, a very special monument. <laughs> right, yeah, and, you know, and first on, on, on Yaki and the Yaki Foundation, um, the Yaki Foundation does great work and unfortunately they continue to perpetuate um, the idea that Tom Yaki was even a beloved figure um, by all, right? I'm sure, not by all. Uh, and, and this is when we start to think about uh, who tells the story of our history, mm -hmm. that, that that really matters. Who gets to say who was beloved, uh, and who, who and who has very little say in the public space about that right now? And what we see is people trying to to um, to reclaim uh, the, the that ability to be able to, to be able to even criticize what's in, what's in public spaces. Um, so some of you may not have written before about the um, the, the so-called emancipation statue, uh, which features um, a stately-looking Abraham Lincoln uh, towering over a nearly naked. Uh, black man who is down on one knee. Uh, and this statue is, has been here for quite some time. It's actually a replica of a statue that exists in Washington, D.C. And so um, you, I encourage you to look it up, the Emancipation Statue in, um, in what's either called Park Square or Lincoln Square. You'll be able to find it either way. Uh, and some of the story briefly around this statue is that, um, you know, as the story goes, after Abraham Lincoln uh, was assassinated, a uh, woman named Charlotte Scott 
uh, a black woman who had been recently freed uh, says, I want to give the first $5 of my earnings to some kind of monument to Abraham Lincoln. Now, that could have been a school, that could have been anything, but, um, but people sort of took that literally. And money was raised from, from freed black persons, uh, many in the Union Army, actually, to be able to put the statue together. Unfortunately, however, uh, none of those folks had any say in what the statue would actually look like. Uh, and the, um, the best that the imagination of the folks who were on the side of ending slavery could come up with was uh, what I described earlier, a stately Abraham Lincoln with a black man nearly naked down on one knee in front of him. Uh, in Boston, that statue at some point in the black community came to be known as Shine Sir, uh, meaning that the, um, the, the figure down on his knee looked like a boot black, like he was, he was there to shine Abraham Lincoln's um, shoe. Um, there was a movement back in the 80s to remove this statue. Uh, Art Commission was involved in this, and, uh, and then later City Council ended up holding a vote on it. They voted unanimously to keep it. And part of the reason they voted unanimously to keep it was actually a fallacy. And they said black folks funded this, true as far as we know, but also that they were involved in, in, sort, of, in sort of crafting this depiction. And that was false. In fact, when Frederick Douglass, who gave the oration at the unveiling of that statue in Washington, D.C., by the way, what an oration. You could find it or read it online. He would said some things about Abraham Lincoln, who he considered a friend. <laughs> and we said, he, said, he said, yes, he did some great things, but make no mistake, if it came between the preser preservation of the Union and freeing enslaved people, he would have chosen the Union every day, yeah. twice on Sunday. Okay? Um, but in that speech, one of the things he said, uh, after this thing was unveiled and there were Supreme Court justices and Ulysses S. Grant, the president, foreign dignitaries, after that statue was unveiled, uh, he said that a more manly disposition would have been that man up on his feet rather than down on his knees. Um, and so there was criticism even at the time, uh, and that criticism has continued. And so the city council uh, at that time in the 80s wrongfully um, uh, decided to keep it based on a fallacy, the idea that, that this is the, the depiction that black folks of the time actually wanted. And it so, remains still. Um, so what do we say to folks who, um, who argue that when we take down a monument or when we have to change all these names and banners and whatever, that we're somehow rewriting history or erasing history? Um, what's mm -hmm. the argument back about that? Do you want to comment on that? Or you can punt if you like. No, I'm not going to punt. Uh, many of these monuments are not really about accurately representing history. Mm -hmm. And the Confederate monuments are a perfect example of this. You know. They were erected almost all of them decades and decades after the Civil War. You know, you'd never know the South lost for, to, to <laughs> judge from these monuments. And they're purely symbols of white supremacy. And their only, they're only purpose is oppression. So, I mean, I, I don't understand what history would be preserved. Yeah. It's you not real. Do you comment on that question? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, uh, they were, many of these statues were put up there intended to terrorize um, local communities. Um, to perpetuate uh, another myth, another fallacy, this idea of the lost cause. Uh, and, uh, and they remain still. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think we do need to look at is, is why folks are so connected to, um, to these monuments and, and that we need to dive into is this, this idea around like sense of loss for people. Uh, and we see this, we hear this, and you know, when you listen to the State of the Union address last night, if you did, um, if you mustered up the, the courage and the energy to be able to power through that. Um, but, but this idea that, that things are, not just that things are changing, but they're changing in a way that means less for us, right? And that these statues, uh, for these folks who want them to stay up, these, these Confederate statues in particular, um, it is about their way of life being, um, being diminished, their values being diminished, uh, and them as people. Um, uh, being diminished, and, and that's something that we need to contend with because that's a powerful feeling. It's a really powerful feeling that we need mm -hmm. to contend with. And how do we? That's one of the questions I've had on my mind about this. How do we? How do we almost manage the emotional? Uh, you know, um, I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for, but the you know the emotions, the feelings that that this evokes in people who are afraid of giving up something that they think that they hold dear and that they think is, you know, a, an accurate, complete depiction of their personal history or their social history. How do we, how do we... At um, some point they have to give up this idea that they get to write history. Mm. 
which is what it's really about, you know? It's really, it's really a question of who gets to write the history, mm -hmm. right? Who gets to say who Tom Joshi was, mm -hmm. right? or who Robert E. Lee was, for that matter. Now, they don't have an eternal perpetual right to write the history to some, and, and to write the rest of us out of it. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that to me. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think also, uh, you know, there are people that may be convinced, right? And that's, that's part of my work is trying to convince folks that, that, um, that, that, that are at least willing to have the conversation. And they may be convinced by by understanding the true history of this country, and they may be convinced by understanding the impact that, for instance, um, racism and, well, going back before race, slavery and then um, yeah. Jim Crow and racism has had since, but not all of them. I mean, there are some people that will never be convinced. Uh, and it really is, and we remember that these, these statues, these monuments, these memorials, these names, they were put up by the people with the privilege and the power to do so. That's right. Uh, and we are not bound for all eternity to keep them up. And that every day, those of us now with, um, with the privilege and power uh, to do something about it are making a decision every day. Like there is no neutral position here. You say like, we're just not gonna do anything. Well, by doing nothing, you're doing something because the statue remains, the name remains. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our politicians, uh, people in power that have the ability to either maintain or remove um, these statues, uh, these monuments, these memorials, these names, they are making a decision every day to keep them there. Uh, and, and, and Adrian and, and many others rightfully put public pressure uh, on, on the community. And, and the Red Sox actually saw this and said, yes, if we're, gonna do, if we're gonna be what we say we are, which is an inclusive organization that is about bringing everyone into this park, then there's no way that we're gonna have them walk down the street named Yawkey Way. Uh, and that's the, I mean, this is the power of public pressure. Mm -hmm. So how do we manage the complicated persona of people like Lincoln, even people like Yawkey, who is, I think, less complicated, but still, you know, folks will argue sometimes that to take down that is to erase their legacy completely when there's some good here you well, know what are the questions you're going to quickly come to mm -hmm. particularly in a city like boston is how far do we go right mm -hmm. what about washington street what about columbus avenue mm -hmm. right how you know and uh, so it, it gets that's why this debate is not going to go away mm -hmm. and it, it, it gets very complicated and do you have any feelings about the you know the line in the in the sand the washington street in the sand if you will no <laughs> I, I really don't I, to me, it's a case-by-case -case situation, mm -hmm. it really is. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I have a, a fixed idea of how far do you go. Okay. Yeah, so when the, when the president point. after Charlottesville said, where, you know, where does it stop, Lee and then Jefferson, I'm like, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then keep Washington. Going. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep going. Uh, say a few more. And, and, and when we think about, you know, I think Washington is, is actually an excellent example in terms of us to, to really say, like, like, why can't we criticize George Washington? I mean, in his plantation, he had over 300 enslaved people working on his plantation. Imagine what you could do if you had 300 people working at no cost on your behalf. Well, you can start a business, you can <laughs> so self-actualize, you can start a revolution, <laughs> right? And that is the, that, like, we have to, when we see something like Washington Street, maybe it should say Washington and the people he enslaved street, right? <laughs> Maybe it should because he was certainly not able to do the things that, that, that he did that many consider um, right and honorable deeds were it not for the fact that he actually had wealth that derived from the, from the ownership of other human beings. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the, the idea that we can't have that conversation, well, it's anti-American, first of all, but, um, but, but it also means that we can't have a conversation about our history and that we can't really take a look at um, and what it means to be American. Um, there, you know, we have these moments, uh, I'm involved in town meeting over in, in, in Brookline, and we have these moments where before we, we, you know, we stand and there's the American, uh, the American anthem is played, um, but we don't yet have a recognition of the land uh, uh, that was taken from, from the indigenous folks here, and we don't yet have a recognition at the beginning of that about the, the legacy of slavery in our own town. And that if we're going to play the anthem, then we've got to play the other side, too. And we've got to talk about the other side, too, because the anthem and, and what's in there is just one part of the story. 
There was a school in Brooklyn that was renamed a couple of years ago. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, and you're uh, in the audience here is Deborah Brown, who is one half of the team along with Ann Greenwald that led the um, the movement to change the name of the devotion school, which was named after a slaveholder who was, by the way, unremarkable in any other way. Uh, <laughs> the only thing remarkable about it is that he owned another human being, uh, and um, and and Deborah and Ann and others um, pushed for the for the name to be changed. Uh, it has since been changed to the Coolidge Corner School, and now we're going through a process where the community involving the kids and involving um, uh, the, the students and the teachers and the family members and also folks from the community that, that are having a say in what, what we're going to rename that school today. I think it's great. Thanks for being here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so a question for Adrian. I've, I've read your columns, and I noted that you feel one way about renaming Yaki, you feel another way about Faneuil Hall. Can you say more about why those this two This is going to come up. I should say that uh, some, of the, <laughs> some of the strong advocates of renaming Faneuil Hall are here, and I'm sure we'll hear from them okay. uh, as we go on. In this. Um, my feeling about Faneuil Hall is this. Well, first of all, Faneuil Hall gets its name because Hall, Faneuil gave the building to the city in mm -hmm. 1740. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a monument to Faneuil, per se. Um, I'm not against renaming Faneuil Hall. I felt that it was not, it's not as important a symbol in the city as Yaki Way was. And because of Yaki's legacy of, raci of open racism and because, you know, and because of the whole Red Sox thing. Okay. But, you know, there, there is a robust movement to rename it. And like, as I say, I don't oppose it. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of neutral. Okay. So agnostic about it. Yes. Um, <laughs> what, any feelings yeah. from you on Agnostic's that? Agnostic's a good word. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I err on the side of let's have the conversation, you know. Um, well, I'm all for it, the conversation. Yeah, right. I mean, it, th that's that's really where I am. I mean, I think that th that we cannot say, no, that is off limits for any particular reason, mm -hmm. that that is not something that we can reconsider. I just I just don't think that 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 is the place that we want to be. I want to be uh, clear. I don't, I don't think any of these no, conversations agree, are off limits yeah. at all. Yeah. yeah. No. OK. Um, Back to the complicated people question for just a moment. I just want to touch on this and see what it ignites, but um, or not. Um, so yesterday afternoon and evening, I had uh, gathered with my colleague Adriana Black. We gathered some students together and had a showing of the movie "The Night James Brown Saved Boston." It's a documentary that came out about ten years ago about a concert that James Brown did on the night after Martin Luther King was assassinated and the various debates around whether or not they should cancel. And, um, and you know, it's a really interesting political history about Boston and the, the mayor who, uh, the Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, was still living when the documentary was made. And so, you know, we're able to hear from him and other local legislators of the time. Um, and of course, James Brown's people. Um, and one thing, and, and I showed it in part because it's a wonderful historical piece um, that touches on you know, race and racism in Boston at the time. It certainly touches on many aspects of the civil rights movement and touches on and, and focuses on a real sort of musical hero of mine personally. Um, you know, I've been a huge fan of James Brown since I was a kid and I thought this brings everything together for me. And also I recognized and, and it, was, it was brought to my attention and I was, I was duly reminded by some colleagues that James Brown has a really difficult legacy mm -hmm. of abuse. He was he was known to have engaged in domestic violence, and just yesterday, my department chair walks into my office, Rich Sates, and says, uh, "Look at CNN.com." I was like, "Oh God, what is it?" And he's like, "Just what look at CNN.com," and uh, emblazoned on the on the uh, cover page of their website was a big story about James Brown, where they're re you know unearthing more you know. Um, uh, theories about how he actually died and whether or not he had committed this, that, and the other. And so timing was, you know, horrible from my perspective. But um, mm -hmm. but we showed the film and we had a really excellent, nuanced conversation about it anyway. All to say, and that's a lengthy preamble to my question: How how do we wrestle with um, the good, the bad, and the ugly here? I mm -hmm. think with Yaki again, it's it's simpler. With Faneuil, you know, if he was a slave trader who made his money on the backs of slaves and had you know donated a building and was able to through that, you know, that's right. seems relatively simple. But with you know, but with James Brown, man, um, there's James Brown. There's you know, there are others. I mean, the R. Kelly thing was never a big fan, so that's less problematic for me. But still, 
problematic for a lot of people. What do we do with that? And can we take down people, especially when they're still living, but even when they're you know, no longer living? I don't know. It's a complicated right. question, and I wish somebody would just tell me the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we saw that also with, um, for instance, a uh, person like Joe Paterno and the statue being taken down over at, at Penn State after many years. You know, I, I think that uh, when we have new information, we should we should be willing to reevaluate mm -hmm. uh, someone's legacy. Uh, I'm sorry, this is why I was, I was talking earlier with someone about, about the idea of, um, I, I don't feel too great about naming anything while, uh, about, uh, after someone while they're still alive, right? Uh, and and ha it, their legacy hasn't had time to settle, but, but I think one of the things that we've seen um, because of the Me Too movement and people um, that, that, some of which did come forward before, but are now even more empowered to come forward uh, as part of a community is that uh, there's been a lot of people's shameful past that are that are now coming out, uh, and and this idea of the um, the sort of in particular man uh, that uh, the great man uh, idea and complex, you know, I I think we're starting to see that become shattered. Um, think about a guy like Bill Clinton, who we knew a lot about, and you know, uh, many of us who consider ourselves to be uh, on the left side of the political spectrum continue to support him, even after knowing um, the things that, that, that he did surely. Uh, and some continue to support him still. Uh, I think that we have to be willing to reevaluate when we get new information. Mm -hmm. So I should, I have to give up, I don't have any CDs or tapes anymore, so I don't actually have to burn my JV uh, And you know, know when you listen on Spotify, people can see what you're listening uh, to, so just check it out. <laughs> I mean, no. really. What have I got? I got like Raffi no. left after yeah. this. And, and he, even he, you know, he's done some bad stuff. Just I mean, listen to Baby Shark over and over. You find yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts about the complicated uh, histories of people? Who can we? I think we're going to see a lot fewer things named after people. Mm. You know? Because there's so much we don't know about everybody, you know? Yeah, for sure. You know what? And this came up in a way during the Yaki Way debate, you know? The Red Sox didn't want to rename Yaki Way for anybody because, you know, one of the reasons, the reason they went back to Jersey Street was they just didn't want to deal, you know, mm -hmm. because you don't know what's going to come out about anybody. You really mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We should just go to Alphabet City. Leave it at that. <laughs> um, I want to turn to questions of public health. We're here in our School of Public Health. Um, we're having this conversation. Some may wonder, why are we talking about monuments in public health? And I want to... I want to open it up to you all, and I also, I, you know, I definitely want to um, soon invite uh, questions and comments from our um, attendees. But what um, what does this mean to public health as you know it? And Adrian, you were quick to say you know nothing about public health, but I, I'm guessing you know more than you uh, would give yourself credit for. Mm -hmm. What does this do, for instance, to the, you know, psychological, emotional well-being of um, our populations, our communities. What does it What does it mean to have these um, monuments up or come down? And what do you What impact do you suppose it has? You know, when Mitch Landrieu announced that he was taking down some of the Confederate monuments in New Orleans, mm -hmm. he was mayor at the time. He said that he had been talking to Wynton Marsalis and went and talked to him about what it meant to him to walk past like these Stonewall Jackson statues every day of his life as a kid. You know. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about how the purpose of a lot of these monuments has really been psychological intimidation and these expressions of sort of white supremacy and so on. And I, I think they have a huge impact. And if that's mm -hmm. the case, then taking them down should have a great impact too. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Absolutely agree. Uh, they, you know, what, what they do is they actually confirm our assumptions, right? Uh, many of us, uh, folks of color in particular, will walk into a, spa a space and and already, let's say, like a, a university, and assume that it's maybe been uh, accommodated for us, but certainly wasn't built for us, wasn't built with us in mind. And when we see those images of, um, usually there's, you know, uh, all the white men that have been, let's say, president or something, right? Stuff, right? It's, it, it is looming over you. Uh, it is, it confirms, you know, what you already thought about this place, is that, um, that, you've been allowed to be here, but it wasn't for you in the first place, and, and now they've made some space for you. Uh, I think that, um, and that's one of those things, you know, when we look at walking through these, these public spaces, I mean, think when you, next time you walk down, uh, 
that stretch of, of Commonwealth Avenue uh, where they have those monuments that are all there. When you walk in really any neighborhood around here, um, how many of those statues are women, uh, for instance? I mean, we, we, we are in, in many ways just sleepwalking through a, a white patriarchal society and, uh, and, and, and not even really thinking about it. We've just gotten so used to it at this point. Uh, and and our, our built environment around us confirms that every day in ways that, that sometimes are, are, are very subliminal. Uh, but in other times, you know, when you start to think about the negative space, like what's missing? Like, where are we there? I mean, I look in this room and see the diversity in this room, and I certainly don't see it out there in the built environment. Mm -hmm. Like, where are we? Um, and not only that, you know, it's not like we just got here. <laughs> We've been here all along, right? And so the New York Times uh, engaged in this process where they've been starting to write obituaries for people who never got their due during their time, right? Well, what does that look like in the built environment? How do we do that? How do we make people recognize that, that yeah, we missed the boat? Like, the people with the power and the privilege to do so decided not to honor people who, who were just like us. So along those lines, who who gets to decide, hmm. and who should get to decide? You know, I, it seems like this sort of thing often goes to a vote. This sort of thing, you know, either a vote of legislators or a vote of, you know, by referendum or whatever. But who should um, who should be at the table making these decisions about what goes up, what stays up, what comes down? Hmm. Thoughts on that? Well, gosh, everybody. I mean, part of the problem is that th these decisions have been made by such small, closed circles of people, and mm -hmm. often years ago. And you know, obviously, that's not the way these decisions should get made now, mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I, it, the um, the problem with uh, with a sort of uh, a democracy that says we'll we'll follow the majority's rule is that um, that it discounts the feelings, um, the hurt. Of 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 an of a minority, uh, and and we see that happening in, in in certain places where the folks who are in power and the folks who are in the in the majority are maintaining these symbols, and they know that they're hurtful to other people. They know that, they don't care, but they know that, uh, and so um, it really depends on 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 where you are, uh, and you know I think about UNC and the Silent Sam statue. These students try. They try to do it the right way. And they talk to the administration, and they try to, try to say how much it hurt them to have this up here. And by the way, just how ahistorical this, this all is, these monuments being up. Uh, and, and the administration didn't listen, and they went out there, and they took it down themselves. Yeah. Right? That's not, that's, not, that's not the preferred method of taking down. <laughs> taking, I'm not suggesting you all go out there and start ripping off street signs and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not the preferred method. but. But, but you get, I, I hope that, that UNC now recognizes the pain that having that statue there caused. Uh, and I hope that other institutions um, take note and think about that too, uh, and actually end up doing the right thing. You know, um, you know our, our Mitch Landrieu did, and others did something really remarkable where they said, you know what, we're just gonna do it. Um, we're just gonna take it down and when people wake up in the morning, we'll, 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 have, the, we'll have the debate then. But these need to go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wish there were, there were more leaders with that kind of courage. Mm. So if we have, uh, Boston is notorious for being you know, a large urban center that has one of the smallest, or smaller certainly, populations of black and brown people in it compared to New York and DC and other places, others, you know, those are sort of bigger cities, but, um, but still, how do we achieve that sort of equity when the majority of people and people who are mostly in power don't really see a problem as much, don't get it or don't care, or some combination of both of those things? How do we, how do we change hearts and minds, I guess, is sort of what I'm asking, because if it's left to majority rule, we'll never will never progress beyond this until the majority really get it. Right. Is that a rhetorical question that can't be answered? I'm yeah. not sure. I mean, I'll say briefly, I think that the, um, there's an example here, maybe in criminal justice reform, uh, and that, um, I mean, 
it's not like folks haven't been saying for years that this system is screwed up and that it's racist and um, that it's that it's locking people up disproportionately based, you know, um, the, the, the difference between cocaine and crack, for instance, uh, marijuana, et cetera. Like people have been saying this for years, but um, but you see things like um, like Michelle Alexander's book, um, The New Jim Crow, come out. You see things like 13th, the documentary on Netflix that was widely viewed. Uh, and you and you you see a conversation starting to happen. Uh, I think that there are there, you know. And, and by the way, these are artists, right? These are, this is a writer, and this is and this is a filmmaker um, that are able to get us talking and and to make the room and the space for our politicians to say we could, we can, and should have a conversation about this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that that's the same with our policy now. You know, things like like Medicare for all, which were which were even not that long ago considered just, I mean, just a far left fantasy, like something that's not even worth discussing, are now on the table um, as part of our as part of our discussion. Folks need to continue to push, but also I think to educate as well. The other thing I'll say about that is that our political leadership is changing. I mean, right. mm -hmm. you see it with Diana Presley's election to Congress. You've got on your AOC uh, T-shirt. I, I noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you, you see it in the makeup of the Boston City Council. And all of that is going to change the conversation, too. Mm -hmm. And I think really quickly, right. that's going to push the conversation in a direction it hasn't gone in before. Mm -hmm. And you having the power of the pen and, and a pretty wide readership, how has that, how do you see your work as a columnist um, as contributing to that? Are, you, are people writing in saying, I never, I never realized it, I never knew it, thank you for changing my mind, or how does that go for you? People are deeply divided in terms of the Yaki Way issue. Mm -hmm. To some degree, I think it was along racial lines, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, there were there were people. Um, it, it's hard to generalize, but there were a lot of there was obviously a lot of public support for it. I think there was heavy public support for it, mm -hmm. but there was also an intense, really vocal opposition. Mm -hmm. And I think there always will be. I think that the the people who don't want this kind of change are are going to push back hard, mm -hmm. and and they're going. Some of them are going to be in power for some time to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'll continue to be a fight. I'm wondering if I should open it up um, to folks with us today. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. Um, do we have a mic going around or are people just gonna have to shout? Okay, there's no, somebody no coming to you with a mic. So, um, take it away. Thank you very much for um, being here today um, with the administration that we have today and um, the, the power that he has backing him um, uh, with appropriations and when he puts up the wall, he's gonna put his name on that wall. Um, so that's another monument that we also need to think about. Um, I don't know if there's still any Confederate flags flying around in the United States. Um, so I think that's another thing that we need to also um, also bring to uh, Congress and and make sure that he doesn't um, there's, yeah, we just need to stop that um, because he is going to put his name on that wall once he gets that funding. So let's, let's, um, that's another thing we need to also think about. But thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So hand up here. Uh, Raul was being a bit, uh, shy about his contributions to the name change in Brookline too. Uh, I participated in that, and one of the things that we did to get people to really change their attitudes, we went from probably 98% of people opposed to a name change to probably 90% of people in favor of it. And one of the things that we started asking people was, and, and white people, what do you think is happening to your children when they see this? And so part of the, the narrative became one of, you know, you think you're just helping, you know, little Johnny and Bernadette of color. You're also helping your own kids. And as, as that started to seep in, as, as well as the, uh, the emotional and, and physical implications of racism, uh, people started to shift. And the more we had the conversations, the more the people that said absolutely no began appearing to be the outliers. But, you know, there were a lot of people that just, it resonated because it was something 
that over time they began to understand was wrong. And what they also began to understand as wrong was that it wasn't just the name of a school, but it was all of the other issues that a community has that that name is sort of symbolic for. So regardless of what the name is, it sort of brings home the fact that, that there are a myriad of other racial problems that are pervasive in the community. And then I think the next move is to actually begin to look at those issues. So I didn't really have a question. I just, <laughs> I've been down this, I've been down this road. I have a question for you. How long did it take? Uh, how long were you working on this? We sent a letter to the school committee in August of 2017. They blew us off, sent another letter in August, uh, sent another letter in December, and in uh, March filed a warrant article. And by May, uh, the name change uh, was, was, was voted on and approved. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a really long process. And people said it would take forever. And people said you need, you know, hundreds of people. But if you, you don't, if you have a good plan and you have a message that, that resonates with people, I mean, what are we talking about? Six months, soup to nuts? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the beauty of this is that the school department, even when they thought the town was going to drag its feet, you know, the chairman of, of uh, the school committee said, I don't care what, we're not going to maintain this legacy. That is not going to hang over our, he over our heads or the heads of our children. Mm -hmm. And so he got it, and he was willing to say, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that this continues. So. Mm -hmm. Could you say just quickly how aware the school community of parents and kids were that this was an issue about a former slaveholder and about race and racism? Um, how, because I, I think it's, you mentioned, I think one of the appeals to parents of children was, um, I guess by definition, parents have children, um, of uh, that, you know, this is, this is helpful to white kids too, to not be steeped in a legacy of really ugly racism and enslavement. Um, were, were kids part of the conversation at all, or, or was it more of a, like, let's just get this done and we'll let them know that there's a new name? It's interesting because I, I don't think that most of the people in, in, in Brookline knew about Edward Devotion. And one of the things that we did is we used the power of the pen. Mm -hmm. So we got a letter into our local paper, uh, the Globe picked up on it, and wrote basically a scathing editorial about the town of Brookline and how they needed to get rid of that name. Mm -hmm. Well, that touched some people. Well, we tried to do a fair amount of outreach as well. And you know you're hitting home when you can just walk along the street and ask a kid, so what do you know about Edward Devotion? And you've got an eight-year-old that says, oh, he was a slaveholder. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no glossing, no mm -hmm. I don't know, and when we, move to the second phase of the renaming process, I mean, I was really surprised the number of kids that wanted to participate and how eager they were yeah. to do their own homework around what race means in their school and in their communities. Yeah. So, and, and this, this was all manner of socioeconomic background mm -hmm. and race. So something resonated for the kids but, you know, the parents got it too. Yeah, terrific, thank you. Can I put in a plug really quickly? I'm sorry, guys. I don't know if any of you guys are aware of this, but uh, the uh, South End Settlement or the Harriet Tubman House is, is being sold. Folks, we can't let that happen. That is the oldest settlement in North America. We can't let that happen. I mean, if I'm going to do this in 30 seconds. <laughs> Just give if, people a phone number or an email. <laughs> if they are that hard up, if they're that desperate for money, then there should have been a capital campaign. You don't go from saying, we don't have money to less to just sell, unless that's what you intended to do from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So 
My email is Deborah.Brown, the number one, at Comcast.net, and my family's going to shoot me for taking this on. But we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow a skyscraper to end up in that neighborhood, and, pe and people that need the services have nowhere to go. Yeah. So, thank you. Thanks for that. There's a hand behind you over there. Thank you. Okay, so we're in like this little hub of people with very progressive liberal ideas, but what do we do when we encounter people who say that this is suppressing um, white people rights by not letting them have their culture? And I, as a, a person of color, I know it's a symbol of suppression in my community. However, other people see it as this is their culture and that we came, like um, I'm an immigrant so that my culture and the suppression of my culture doesn't matter because we didn't come to America as early as the white people did. So how do, how do you make an argument against that when people say that this suppresses someone else's rights? Hmm. It's a great question. Anybody want to field that? Uh, you know, I, thinking back on the devotion change, I mean, th and that wasn't about culture. No, I mean, no one knew who this man was, right? Um, but there was still, um, that night when the debate took place, there were tears that were shed at the podium, and the tears came from people who didn't want the name changed. And it was literally, it's inertia. It's this idea, no, that's what I've always known it as. This is, this is you know, I've got a connect connection there because that's the school I went to, and, and I simply don't want it changed, and I... And, 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 you know, uh, sweetie, I understand about racism and I understand that it, you know, that it hurts kids to walk into this school, but you know what? That's what it's always been called. That's what it should be called. Those are the folks that cried the tears. I want to talk about like sense of loss and like how powerful uh, a, a, an emotion that is for people. Um, think about now something with what you're talking about where, where it's much more tied into someone's um, sense of pride, although misguided. Um, sense of pride and culture, it's really, really difficult. Uh, and to the point earlier, we're not going to be able to convince everybody um, that, that, um, that these kinds of monuments and memorials should come down. Uh, we can do our best. I say, I'm, I'm all about education. I'm an educator, so I'm all about education. I'm all about talking about history. Uh, I'm all about counter narratives and saying, I know that's what you've always been taught, but here's, here's actually something else that you weren't um, taught about this. Uh, and, and to the extent that that is successful, then great. Uh, when I talk about making change, I say either change the people or you change the people. Uh, so you change the people if you can, right? Otherwise, you swipe left and you change the people <laughs> and you put in different people. So when Adrian's talking about the idea that all these new people are coming into positions of power, like that matters. Uh, and, it, and it can't just be uh, people of color in power in communities of color. It needs to be people of, uh, people of color coming into power in all communities. And we'll, see, we'll start to see those kinds of changes. Thoughts on how to how to deal with those tears? I mean, you know, my, my off the cuff reaction is it, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, white people would think their culture's going away. It's <laughs> we can't escape it. <laughs> you know, it's everywhere we go. Yeah. And yeah. you would have to change a whole lot of names for white culture to be erased in this country. A lot. One of the things that I remember, um, I believe in education, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things we've done as a society here is let TV teach us history. Right. Um, back in the 60s, there was one major publisher for high school history books, Muzzy. Mm -hmm. And he had basically three different history books, one for the North, <laughs> one for the South, oh. and one for the West. Mm -hmm. And how black folks were displayed in those books in the North was quite different from what they did in the South. I grew up loving Davy Crockett and all those things because that's what we were taught. You know, um, manifest destiny and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I never questioned Amherst mm -hmm. as a city or as a school named after a mass murderer. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have allowed this to happen because we don't know history. We don't know about Warren and Dudley. We don't know about the people I think that if people learn true history instead of history, as uh, you were saying, you know, Dick Gregory came up with that term, his story, about <laughs> what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if we learn true history, a lot of this argument would be over. Yeah. 
No one would want to celebrate someone who gave smallpox to wipe out a people. Right. No one would want to celebrate someone who was brutal and um, a, aggressive towards another group of people. So I believe that um, history is very important, that we can no longer let television and the movies mm -hmm. teach us history, because that's where most people have learned their history. So wanted to get that in. Appreciate that. You've even got the yeah. History Channel. I mean, yeah. really. <laughs> it's gone I mean, too I, far. I remember watching the Dukes of Hazard <laughs> and cheering on these good old boys. I don't know what was happening, <laughs> right? Shout out to my parents who were probably watching and made me watch that show. That's mm -hmm. not right. Mm -hmm. But you love the shorts. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, panel, for speaking about these things. Uh, my name is Reverend Joseph Rocha from New Democracy Coalition and um, Prophetic Resistance. It seems as though we here in America always have a problem. There's a conundrum when we start talking about racism and how it affects everything in our, in our community, especially people of color. And it's not so much that we're trying to change history, it's we're trying to write history. You know, scripture says you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It always uh, kind of bothers me when, when people say, uh, why you keep on talking about slavery and all this, why don't you get behind it? But, you know, I don't want to cast aspersions, but when the Jewish community talks about the Holocaust and never again and never forget, well, there's never an uproar about that. But when black folks start talking about slavery, it's like, can't you get over it? Well, as some of the panelists have said, there are subliminal messages, there's psychological effects. And whenever you're dealing with the status quo, it's like you're steering the waters. You know? So it's like getting people that are disenfranchised, getting people that have no voice to come to that table and to talk, and to talk about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. You see, unlearning is sometimes, at times, harder than learning. Mm. So when we check our personal biases and prejudices and stereotypes, isn't that the beginning of unlearning? Mm. And if we go down that path, I think it is a path that will be inclusive, you know, and that will join all people together so that we'll really look at, you know, what's happening here and what is the message that we're passing on uh, to our next generation. Mm. Well, I think the idea that you just put out about unlearning is really powerful. And I think that really is at the heart of a lot of these disputes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. There's a question back there. Hi. Um, my question is um, about the role. We've talked a little bit about like, the role of individuals and communities of individuals coming together to change like the name of the school. What do you think is the role of institutions in um, supporting changes like this in the community? Mm. Great question. Thoughts? <laughs> <He's> like, well, <laughs> no, I, I mean, honestly, I think tremendously important. You know, the um, it, it's about institutions are represented by leaders, right? Yeah. And that we need to demand more of our leaders, yeah. Um, yeah. and that they that they speak up about issues. Um, and you know, I, I always, you know, again, I'm not trying to get you to like go tear down street signs, and I'm not trying to say we should all be out in the street protesting, but. What I can tell you is that the changes that I've seen at our own institution um, have come on the heels of activism, have come on the heels of protest. Um, that there is at Boston University, for instance, uh, a center for gender, sexuality, and activism, um, I think on the heels of protest. That there is um, gender inclusive housing, that there is an expansion of, of support services for students of color and now for first generation students. Like that's come on the heels of, of, of students in, in particular, but others who have, who have pushed, I think, the leadership um, to do so. So we've got to demand more of our leaders and we've got to hold them accountable. Um, but also we, we, need, we need a new type of leadership, a leadership that doesn't need to see a protest or a sit-in before they decide to take the right action, right? Uh, and so what I've seen is, is, is um, in many cases, leadership that, uh, that says no, that says no, and then finally capitulates and then writes a press release about how great they are for doing the thing that they said no to only six months ago. Uh, and so when it comes to institutions, I think we really have to look at the top and, 
and, and push those folks and if, again, change the people or change the people uh, and start to demand a better leadership that's responsive. Because ultimately, all these, all these leaders are doing are actually hurting themselves, they're hurting the brand of their institution by not taking the right action. Uh, and if they were to act in the first place, then you wouldn't see the kind of process that we do right now. You know, institutions are so often barriers to change, you know. They're sort of fundamentally, inherently conservative. They have profited from the status quo. Yeah. That's how they became big, powerful institutions. So they're, they're deeply invested in keeping things the way they are. And I think you're right. It, they need leaders that will push them yeah. in a different direction. Mm -hmm. oh. I have a quick question about congratulations on the name change of the, uh, to the devotion school. I have one question about that, like the, the moving forward. So what happens to devotion? Has he been erased? Or is there more learning, like the school is going to be renamed, et cetera? How do you keep whatever you learned in terms of the process of changing that name? What, how do you keep that going? Yeah. No, that's, that's really important, honestly. And, um, and my, I believe Deborah will correct me whenever I'm wrong. She'll correct me. But, uh, but there's a plan to actually have uh, education. There's been education about the need for the name change now, but then also to be able to have something, some kind of plaque or something that people say, this, is, this was called the Edward Devotion School. Who, here's who he was, and here's why we as a town decided to change it. I think, I think it's a great thing for, for us as a people to be able to say, like, we've, we've thoughtfully reconsidered the name of this place it's a, it's a sense of pride not a not a you know it, it, you can look at it as you know for many years we were wrong and we did this thing and instead say you know right now we were right at this point we said we made this change and we want to tell you about it because it's the kind of story especially for kids going through a school um, the kind of story where you say we are um, we are evolving as a people uh, and 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 I think that's a story worth telling, and so th so that should be part of the physical structure of the school, of course, but then also part of the curriculum too. What's the new name going to be? I mean, what are the I know Good you're question. in a pro I know you're in a process, yeah. but what are the contenders? There, there are so many at this point right now. It's wide open. I don't know. I was, I was saying earlier, I, I liked Ruby Bridges School, and I and I know what I said earlier. I said don't name it after people who are still alive, but she might be my one exception. <laughs> Right? Ruby Bridges, who at the age of six yes. walked into William France Elementary School in New Orleans and integrated that school, yeah. six years old, and had to be escorted the entire year by U.S. Marshals back and forth as people yelled mm. obscenities at her exactly. and has been doing the work since. I'm, I'm okay with naming it after her. To have kids see another kid yeah. who, did, who did something so remarkable, yeah. I mean, that's my vote right now, but I think there's a lot of names in contention. Other questions? Oh, no. Right up front. Um, first of all, let me thank you for having this. I'm a BU alum, so mm -hmm. welcome home to our house. Welcome home to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, back in the 70s when I came to attend Boston University, we, it was during the time of busing. And we had issues at Boston University on campus. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we co-founded the NAACP. We had issues. I used to, on an annual basis, Dr. Silber used to go around and visit each of the dormitories um, which was very nice, and each time, every year, I would go to each one of those meetings and ask the same question um, about affirmative action, about the diversity of the school. A couple of things that I want to say here, uh, and thank everybody for coming, because we need to have larger crowds talking about this. I'm very happy that Adrian, to my view, has moderated his position. I hope that's due to his education and not to our presence. Um, but um, in the articles, you've written three articles um, on this topic, um, and it has evolved. And essentially, in the first article, you said it was a very good idea, it was a noble idea, but there were more important things to talk about, like the resegregation of Boston public schools. That's a 40-year-old issue. It was resegregated when there was busing and there was white flight out of Boston. What didn't happen was all the employees and the teachers and all that, they remained. And you still see the residual effects of that with the disproportionate populations of students mm -hmm. in relation to administrators and, and faculty. What we're trying to do with this and why this is the most important event, and because I taught history in, in school for, I studied history at BU, I taught history in the Boston Public Schools for 25 years. And when Kevin first approached me with this idea, I was like, yo, Kevin, I came to the same conclusion you did, Adrian. There's more important stuff. 
I wish you would write about that stuff more. But there, I agree, there was more important stuff. And then when I looked at the totality of my experience in Boston, I said, this is the dignity of simplicity. It couldn't be more simple than this. This is an argument and a movement based on a moral high ground. In America, that can't lose. And it has not been reduced, as you said in one of your articles, to a food fight about who's with whom. I came on to this issue because Kevin came to me and said, Barry, we can't get a hearing. We can't get a public hearing on this issue. He said to me that we can't practice democracy here. And we were told we could. Now, on the issue of Yaki Way, which I disagreed with, I agree with Adley Stevenson, the Democratic nominee for the presidential campaigns in 1950 and 1952 and 1956. I believe in the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of ignorance. I'm guilty of that. We are all guilty of that. And as he said, with education, education is the key. There would be no debate about education. But in our society today, we move too fast, right? We are already uh, litigating, legislating an issue like cannabis, uh, transgender, uh, gay marriage. Those laws changed before education changed, before there was an education laid for the generational problem that we have. Because if you find with a lot of these sexual harassment things, they're older guys. Older guys that got away with it through their teens, through their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. They're going to have to die off. But they are serving as a good deterrent to younger people mm -hmm. to stop doing that. This is a fight to change the narrative of our city, Adrian. A narrative that has gone all the way back to the witch trials. A narrative that says this is a racist city. I'm a military brat. So when I live in a place for 40 years, I value it and I call it home. And I take offense to anyone calling this a racist city. New York City has more hate crimes than we do. They're not defined as a racist city. Atlanta, uh, Chicago, all of those cities had a change in leadership where you had racist people in the city. But the city came together and said, we're going to elect Maynard Johnson as mayor of Atlanta to show that we have changed. We're going to elect in Chicago um, uh, Harold um, uh, who to say that we have changed. We have not made those statements in Boston. And as far as the change of the Boston City Council to more progressive, there's not one man of color on that city council. There are a lot of symbols of change, but there's not action for change. Faneuil Hall is an easy way to change the narrative. We as citizens, we don't go down there. I don't hang out there. Their prices are too high. <laughs> this is our message. This is our message to the world. This is our message to the, na uh, to the nation. Boston is changing. And we want you to come to our city because we are changing. Now, the Walsh administration has been making efforts to do that. But I think they are predominantly occupied by optical delusions that say that we have diversity. This is a fight that I have found that has grown as more people have become educated. And I think that I would ask you, Adrian, to start and look and examine that is issue and write a column on demanding that they practice the democracy they preach. The city council is in an election year this year. And I've said, and I work for them, I know of many of them, I like them, I love them. But on this issue, we cannot give ground. And my litmus test, you do not get my vote unless you hold a hearing and you practice the democracy you preach. Thank you for stating that case so eloquently. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to add one thing um, about universities and all. Right. Um, this year, last year, woo, already, um, we celebrated the 50th year of our takeover of the bursar's office at Northwestern University, mm -hmm. where I went to school. See, take over the place where the money is. I like that. There you that. go. <laughs> and that was our plan, you know? <laughs> yep, we took over the bursar's office, and nobody could get paid, so we had a short takeover. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. um, but all these gains that we made at Northwestern mm -hmm. are disappearing. Yeah. The right. promises made were enacted. They celebrated it last year. The president hosted 
um, what they call the 100, the, the 100 of us who went into the bursar's right. office. But I've watched them chip away slowly mm -hmm. at the promises they made. I went to BU, I'm a BU grad, right. for grad school. And they're still struggling to have an African American studies program. Mm -hmm. Still wow. struggling, I went in 70. They're still struggling to keep it going. Um, I went to Boston College Law School. Mm -hmm. Four black students in the law school, I mean one class. That's ridiculous from the promises made um, when those who came before me fought. Mm -hmm. See, I know that I'm a child of affirmative action. I got to go to Northwestern. That never would have happened if other people hadn't fought for that. Right. So I know that we have to keep fighting that fight and helping others get that opportunity. I have to be careful how I say this. The Me Too movement has supplanted the civil rights movement in a lot of ways. And people don't want to talk about racism anymore. People don't want to address the symbols of racism that are so obvious. Some of them are so obvious that it seems like, why do we even have to have a discussion about them? Yeah. You know, but yet they stand. And I, for one, am angry that, and I'm gonna be careful here, that my generation <laughs> has not passed the mantle to a younger generation to take up the fight. We haven't educated them about some, my kids grew up in a totally different world than I did. You know, they're both teachers, my two sons are both teachers in Boston, but they see the world so different. Mm -hmm. I never would have believed Barack Obama could be president. We argued about it and they believed he could. But my life history said, no, he couldn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the difference. And so I recognize that um, I need to step aside a little bit and let them take the lead. And that I can be a consultant or advisor or whatever <laughs> on the side, but that it's their fight. And that's why I love your shirt. Because they are the people who are now taking a different fight, right. but the same fight yes. mm -hmm. uh, from us. And I love them for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to insist on rewriting history, yeah. telling the true history, true. and quit glorifying history. Yeah. I didn't get to watch the football game because I'm on strike. <laughs> you know, and you know, I, love, I was gonna be the world's greatest football player, so you know I love football. <laughs> but I couldn't watch it because of how yeah. they treat yeah. Well, let me, let me say this, is, um, is <laughs> and thank you for your comments, and I love all the, the BU alums coming back. This is great. Uh, but, you know, when folks say uh, things like um, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice, um, I say it's not the whole story. If it's bending, it's bending because people are bending it. And, and it can bend right back if we let it. And I think we've seen that. I think there was a shock to our system in 2016. Uh, and some of us already knew that things weren't going so well before that election anyway, right? <laughs> Lots of us did, right? But there was a shock to the system where it said, no, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. And the gains that are made, whether on a campus or in a community or anywhere, can actually be lost. Yeah. And they can be lost not in a matter of a generation, but much less than that. Uh, and so we have to remain ever vigilant and continue to do this work because uh, we are not guaranteed the progress that we've seen right now. We're just not guaranteed it. And I would, I would add to that that um, I think there's hope for the future um, also because the Me Too movement is actually an intersectional movement if we tell the whole story about it. Tarana Burke did not, you know, she is not a white feminist, right? And so for all, you, all the people in my class at six o'clock, we'll talk about this more. <laughs> um, but she is, you know, she is an intellectual uh, intersectional feminist who is who is bringing together uh, I think the you know the power of civil rights and the power of feminism and saying me too and enough together and I that's that's what gives me hope and yeah, my kid who's 17 is an intersectional feminist already he went to the march with an intersectional feminism mm -hmm. sign and I was super proud about it so <laughs> I feel some hope in that that we're right. not it's no longer dividing the pie but actually you know exploding it and making it a huge mm -hmm. giant pie 
Right. Well, it's a coalition of all the people who have felt shut out, right? Mm -hmm. and, and closed out and written out of history. No. And that's a lot of groups. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it's, it's tragic that um, folks remain, in a certain sense, written out of history. So we raised the issue of uh, Faneuil Hall. Actually, the Faneuil Hall uh, issue rose in some ways, in some ways as an affirmation of the work of the Boston Globe. You know, Boston Globe a couple of years ago published a series of articles. Uh, uh, Adrian Walker contributed to those, off those articles that explained the city in such stark racist terms that it was unbelievable and tragic. And instead of white people coming to the rescue, instead of the Boston Globe coming to the rescue, rescue Boston Globe is a, a white supported, white led or institution in the city. Uh, there were people around town who were, who were black and educated and, and feeling empowered who said that we should respond to the tragedy uh, that was being dispelled in the Boston Globe series articles. So you get all these kind of uh, uh, indices around pathology, you get the murder rate, you get the health disparities, you get incarcerations, you get poverty, you got Boston as a hyper-segregated city. And so, uh, latching on to what was happening around the country in terms of mon uh, monuments. Uh, there were a group of people who came together and says that Faneuil Hall represents uh, a symbol of white supremacy. And uh, there are institutions, ironically, that support, um, uh, including the Boston Globe, that support um, opposing this white supremacy. And we saw it reflected in the, in the Yawkey Way uh, uh, saga, so to speak. Uh, Adrian, I think you supported the, the, the change of Yawkey Way, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, so it comes to the surprise and shock to many of us that a institution such as the Boston Globe, which purports to be uh, progressive uh, and liberal, uh, would oppose uh, the changing of the name of an institution, an edifice like Faneuil Hall, which is clearly defined by the legacy of slavery and defined by a person who hated black people. And the question is for the activists in, uh, amongst ourselves in the city is what do we tell our children when, when they ask about uh, Faneuil Hall? Uh, do we lie to them? Do we say that um, it's okay to celebrate uh, this building uh, because it really doesn't matter um, that um, that um, Faneuil Hall, Peter Faneuil was a racist because it was 300 years ago. What do we tell our children? How do we grapple with the, um, the, uh, the, the what may be the moral equivalency between what happens in, on, in, on Yawkey Way and the change and energy around that and the support from one of the uh, major institutions in the city, the Boston Globe, how do we, how do we deal with the moral uh, contradictions that our children may, may, may engage when they look at what we did in 2019 with regard to uh, dealing with the, the, the legacy of slavery. Now, I'm, I'm surprised. I used to uh, be a guest op-ed columnist at the Boston Globe. You know that. I will not do it again because it, it reflects the kind of disregard for black people in this city uh, behind the guise of trying to speak up for them. Now, I know the, 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 the series was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, so y'all doing your work. Uh, but at the same time, when, when black people who understand the history and want to clarify things for the city and clarify things for their city in terms of and their children, in terms of uh, truth and justice and what democracy means, the, the Boston Globe has been nothing but hostile. Now, it's not only the Boston Globe, because we see instances of racism all across the city institutionally. BU, I'm alum, BU also. Right. Um, but other institutions. And so it comes, it strikes me as a major embarrassment to live in a city and to be friends with people at the Boston Globe uh, when, when the tires hit the road and the question around racial disparity is raised within the context of Faneuil Hall. Now, Faneuil Hall, the name change is only metaphorical. A, a, a pathway for us to talk about race and reconciliation yes. and the legacy of it. Mm. Now we know 
that black men in this city, and, I'll, and I'll, this is a comment you can respond to, we know that black men in this city are criminalized. Black on black crime, crime and, and, and so many other ways, unemployment. But we cannot disconnect the, the condition of black men in this city in 2019 with the condition of black men in the 1700s where they were sold in the Faneuil Hall marketplace where the food court is. We cannot con connect a disconnect from a legacy of, of racism in the city and be responsible within the context of democracy. And it is our duty individually and it's the duties of institutions who, which purport to be progressive and liberal to respond to it. So when black people come to the Boston Globe and ask for help as a leading institution and they say no and they ridicule us, we all should be ashamed. When did the Boston Globe ridicule you? Uh, uh, well, you've ridiculed me. Uh, the, the, the last just, art, the last, well, 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 you represent the Boston well, Globe. Well, Excuse me. Okay, when the Boston I've Globe doesn't I, speak, there I are people. Have, I have, dis people, there I have disagreed with you. Oh, oh, okay. No, well, I did not the, the picture of me, the, the picture of me being sold at, on the auction block, was 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 described to you as amateurish. Now it may have been amateurish because we're not theater, uh, we, we're, we're not Hollywood, we're not Broadway, but we were trying to make. The, the, the moral point. I understand. Um, well, now, I don't think you understand because you, you, you belittled people who were black people who are among the most uh, um, uh, hurt in this city, socially, economically, politically, uh, culturally. You, you, you deny the statement that they were trying to make about empowerment and self-expression and being written into, to, into the history properly. We know that Peter Faneuil sold a black boy, raised the funds to, to, to purchase uh, Faneuil Hall. That's why we're there, to tell that story symbolically. Now when black people come, knowing that story, not knowing that boy's name, and want to say, what's his history? What was that boy's name? And they want to say, we should call that boy freedom and democracy in Boston, and the Boston Globe uh, through you or its editors. I don't know, they may have changed your, your, your depiction of what we were doing. But what they did was, was, was denigrate a group of people who was simply want to express themselves as being part of the democracy in Boston. And the Boston Globe, which uh, purports to be a, a, a support of democracy, says nothing to, about, uh, to the Boston City Council or the mayor when people have written him five times asking him for a hearing around the feasibility, not to change the name, but the feasibility of changing the name. And the Boston Globe does nothing. Now I've gone to the Boston Globe uh, op-ed board uh, through the phone and through email and asked, may I say something through the pages? And they've said no. Now, shame on many institutions across the city in terms of uh, how they turn their, their head away from racism in the city. Shame on the Boston Globe in particular. Thank you. Let's allow the panelists to respond, please. Well, first of all, I dispute the way I dispute the notion that I belittled you and hey, I belittled. Well, look, 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 we got we, we got eleven minutes to go. Let me just you, you've talked. Let me just let me just say it. let me just say that it was never my intention to belittle anybody. When, what I did say was that I didn't love the idea of of enacting the slave trade, which I which I didn't. I have a you know. I have a problem with it. Um, I think there are better ways to make the point and to make the protest. Not to tell you how to do what you do, but you know, I have a right to my reaction to it. But I didn't, I didn't belittle anybody. The only thing I'm guilty of is disagreeing with you. What you have said to me when I interviewed you for the columns I've written was that the point of this is to spark a conversation. I strongly support having a conversation. I have always wanted to have a conversation. We have wanted to have, the, we're having that conversation in part right now. Whether Faneuil has, has to be renamed to have that conversation is an open question. So well, one that, final, we very quick on the, um, yeah. comment, heavily, very quick. And this is our last one. So I have full confidence that not into this question, but I'm just going to straight to the point. Take the microphone. Take the mic. Yes. Um, are you aware of any context in which we are currently challenging the presence of a president of a United States president president being memorialized and this comes out of um, I'm not a BU alum I'm a James Madison University alum and um, we are never 
the way the three-fifths compromise is presented to us is this was the compromise that saved the union back when the union was being established. Um, and you know what? It created a country that existed because it was bought off of people's lives. So are there any situations in which we are asking ourselves, does a president need to be memorialized in the way that he is being memorialized currently? A past president. You're, you're referring to, okay, right, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, well, I'll say at Princeton had a conversation about the Woodrow Wilson School there. Um, they actually decided to keep that name. Now, Woodrow Wilson was someone uh, who, um, who, who refused to allow uh, black folks to work in his administration. And, and by default, I mean, the administration. We're talking about all of the, the, the not just in the White House, but the wide-ranging administration. Uh, and, um, and that school, Princeton, uh, did a full review and actually decided to keep the name of the Woodrow Wilson School. Example, yeah, President. right. Also right. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank our panel and our moderator for a wonderful, robust discussion. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. All right. Thank you all. And um, please uh, enjoy some food and drink in the back, and uh, come again. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you all. Thanks, y'all.